Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's speech by the National Security Advisor, Sir Stephen Lovegrove, hosted by the Council on Geostrategy, the newest British strategic affairs think tank based in the heart of London and dedicated to making the United Kingdom, as well as other free and open nations, more united, stronger and greener. We are honoured to host Sir Stephen, whose speech today will address a range of issues relating to the United Kingdom's national security, including the lessons we might draw from the events in Afghanistan, the value of international partnerships, and the importance of the integrated review, Global Britain in a more competitive age. If I might just say a few words in terms of a biography. Sir Stephen has had an illustrious career in the civil service, having held the position of permanent secretary in both the Ministry of Defense and the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Now, as national security advisor, he provides advice to the prime minister and the cabinet on national security, including strategy, policy, capability, and civil contingencies. Thank you for joining us, Sir Stephen. But before we start, a couple of housekeeping rules. Sir Stephen will speak for between 25 and 30 minutes. He has then agreed to answer questions from our guests. You can ask questions during the whole course of the speech, but please make sure to indicate your name and affiliation. I would just like to point out that the question and answer session will take place off the record. The speech, however, is public. Thank you. I will now hand over to Sir Stephen. Well, thank you very much, uh, James, and thank you very much for having me here today uh, at the Council on Geostrategy. I've been really impressed with the Council's work, um, and I very much welcome the way that you're challenging the status quo, and I support your mission to strengthen Britain and reassert our leadership in an increasingly uncertain and dangerous world. And it is an uncertain world, and it's one in which the pace of change is accelerating. So what I want to do today is to take a step back from the immediate rush of events. It's easier said than done, as I found out in my first few months as National Security Advisor, but it is essential to make the attempt. And I'd like today to reflect, including in the light of the events in Afghanistan, on some of the things that haven't, have changed and some of the things that haven't. Now, Afghanistan has been a feature of many of our lives in different ways for the past 20 years. Over the weekend, we remember the devastating attack that took place in 2001 in the heart of New York City, in Washington, DC, and in Pennsylvania. The events of 9-11 have shaped much of the last two decades of our foreign and security policy. Now, it is a truism that we all remember where we were on that day, and I won't regale you with my own memories, Safe to say that I was working as an investment banker at Deutsche Bank, whose building adjacent to the Twin Towers was destroyed, when my poor colleague on the research floor, where they had televisions, called me and said, you better come over. History is being made. And indeed it was. Although none of us could have predicted that we would spend much of the next 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq, dealing with the consequences of decisions that were taken in the months that followed. And as a banker back then, I certainly didn't anticipate that I would be sitting here in front of you now, exploring whether our withdrawal from Afghanistan would see us having to adopt a fundamentally different approach to national security. But the juxtaposition of the anniversary of that attack with our withdrawal from Afghanistan has naturally led some to pose difficult questions to question whether the events of the recent weeks herald the end of the long American century and whether American security guarantees can be relied on, to ask if NATO's relevance is reducing, to query whether they have terminally undermined the West's, by which I mean the political West's, values and credibility, to ask whether the limits of Britain's independent agency have been properly and realistically calibrated and if we need a radical rethink of our strategy. My answer to those questions is firmly no. That is not to understate the importance of the events of the last few weeks, nor the human cost. There are implications that we do need to consider very, very carefully. There is a debt that we owe to those who have sacrificed so much to deliver two decades of progress to the people of Afghanistan. There's a need to ensure that events in Afghanistan do not become a call to arms for terrorists at home or abroad. 
and we will work through both of those challenges with our allies, partners, and I hope with groups like this one. But I believe the fundamentals of the approach that the government set out in the integrated review published earlier this year remain absolutely the right ones. My proposition is that we have already changed a great deal in how we are thinking about, the, about security across government. And today I want to say more about what we mean by integration, the integration of our values and our interests, integration with our allies and partners, and integration across government, ensuring that we make the best use of the full range of levers of national power. Let me begin by reminding you of the world that the integrated review described. It describes an increasingly complex environment, which is characterized by the need to confront a range of diverse and networked threats to the UK, its people and its interests. It emphasizes geopolitical and geoeconomic shifts, not least as a result of China's increasing assertiveness and the direct threat posed by Russia. It warned against a complacent defense of the status quo, given the pressure that the international system is coming under. It set out how the return of systemic competition means that we will need to confront adversaries and competitors across a range of activity, from legitimate economic competition to much more malign state threats, both covert and overt. It recognized the transformational nature of technology and the potential risks of prol proliferation. And it described how we will need to confront these emerging global challenges, including by building resilience at home. Now, I doubt that many would challenge the validity of that diagnosis and assessment. But do events in Afghanistan invalidate the vision of Britain in the world that the integrated review paints of a problem solving, load bearing ally investing in and protecting our technological edge of a country more deeply engaged in areas of the globe where we have historic ties, but where we have been less active in the recent past? I don't think so. My judgment is that recent events demonstrate that we must double down on the trajectory that the IR sets out. We should strengthen our determination to build UK capabilities and work with partners to capitalize on the UK's great strengths. How we do that will of course be crucial, but I see nothing that fundamentally changes the strategy. In order to deliver security for the people of the UK, we need to do a number of things. We need to pursue an energetic policy of promoting our interests overseas in order to safeguard them at home. We need to work with a wide range of allies and partners who share our values and our interests. And we need to assemble all the lead levers of statecraft to promote the UK's interests from trade to science and technology to diplomacy. The first component of this approach is to energetically pursue our interests. And in the era of systemic competition, it is impossible to divorce our interests from our values. The nations of the UK are bound by the shared values that are fundamental to our national identity, democracy, and way of life. These include a commitment to universal human rights, the rule of law, free speech, fairness, and equality. These are values that are shared by our closest allies and partners. They're the values that helped us win the Cold War. They're the values that have ensured the UK is and will remain a global power, including through our cultural influence. The global release finally of the latest of the James Bond films shows that the intelligence ag agencies can do soft power too. Demonstrating by example that free and democratic government delivers greater security and prosperity for citizens wherever they are, must be at the heart of the approach we take to competition in the 21st century. We do not defend these systems and values out of a sense of nostalgia, but because a world in which democratic societies flourish and fundamental human rights are protected is one that is more conducive to our sovereignty, security, and prosperity as a nation. The IR committed the UK to a more active role in shaping a future international order that remains open, fit for the challenges ahead, based on democratic values and restored to a spirit of global cooperation. Defending our values is at the heart of this government's agenda. It is as important in our strategy towards China and Russia as it is in countering violent extremism. 
Now, that will not always be easy. Events in Afghanistan are good evidence of that, but our actions demonstrate our commitment. We will not, as the UK, stand aside to let Afghanistan become a new centre for terrorism, either directed or inspired. We will stand by the people of Afghanistan with humanitarian aid, pressing the Taliban to ensure a safe environment for its delivery and safe passage for those who want to leave. Creating the conditions for greater stability and security will allow us to better deliver our interests and vice versa. And that is why we will remain invested in the future of Af Afghanistan and will lead a concerted and coordinated effort from the international community. The experience in Afghanistan reinforced the challenges set out in the integrated review and that they are global. They impact our partners in Europe, in the US, in the Indo-Pacific, just as much they, as they impact on us, and of course, those in the immediate region. No country will be able to influence them alone, and I doubt any would seek to. The need to work in partnership to maximise our impact was a key feature of the approach set out in the IR, and it's an area where the UK has great strengths. From our leading role in NATO to our strong strategic bilateral relationships, to our position at the heart of the Commonwealth, the UK has an extraordinarily broad and deep international set of partnerships that provide our security and improve it and our prosperity. The IR makes clear that we will continue to benefit from and invest in these alliances. We've seen this year what we can achieve through these relationships. We've delivered a G7 summit, which brought together world leaders in Cornwall to discuss the challenges we face and agree how we will begin to address them. We'll soon host COP26 to ensure that we move ahead in tackling the universal threat posed by climate change. And we will need to work closely with allies, uh, with nations less familiar to us, at least in that guise. For example, Russia, China, and Iran are all deeply invested in securing a stable Afghanistan. Our approach is and will always be international. That is not incompatible with acting in our national strategic interests. Rather, it is central to doing so. If we are able to prevail in this era of systemic competition, we will do so with allies and partners. NATO is and will remain the bedrock of our security. The collective security provided by the Alliance is our first last and best guarantee against any existential threat posed by any adversary. It's the most successful military alliance in history, and we are totally committed to a leadership role. We're delivering on that commitment every single day, whether that's through our significant investment in the modernization of our, our armed forces, through our contributions on the ground, such as to provide an enhanced forward presence in Eastern Europe, or through our drive to modernize the alliance so that it remains at the heart of our approach throughout the 21st century. Fundamentally, this alliance has been successful because it has bound US and European security together. And there have been rivers of ink spilt in recent weeks about the decline of both US power and that country's commitment to our shared security. Arresting though that commentary might be, it is only, and it is just that commentary and it is wrong. The US has unrivaled economic strength. It has the most powerful military that the world has ever seen, and its protective umbrella continues to sh offer shelter to countries across the world. Its soft power can be seen in every corner of the globe, and its values and its way of life continue to be the ones that most ordinary people aspire to. Now, I have spoken candidly to counterparts from Europe and the Far East, and not one of them has expressed any concern whatsoever about the nature and firmness of any US security guarantee. Now, that is not to say that it's wrong or dangerous to ask the question publicly or privately. It's the hallmark of a mature, honest debate that we can do so, but it is important to be loud and to be clear about the answer. Our adversaries typically do not have allies that they rely on. We do, and the US has always been, and will continue to be, foremost amongst them. Is the US's economic dominance likely to be challenged in the decades that come? Of course, 
But the idea that the US is either in terminal decline or has suddenly become uninterested in the world is eyewash. I'm proud that we've renewed our historic ties through the signature of the Atlantic Charter by the Prime Minister and President Biden in Cornwall. Our cooperation across foreign policy, intelligence and defence is unparalleled. And our partnership with the US enables the UK and our European partners to play a more active role than we would otherwise be able to. That's not to say that we won't sometimes disagree or have different areas of focus or emphasis. Like the US, the UK will always be guided by a clear-sighted assessment of our national interests. But in this complex and interconnected world, our respective strategic interests will almost always align. I am reassured by my US contacts commitments to working in partnership with us, and I expect to see that commitment underscored in the administration's forthcoming national security strategy, its national defense strategy, and its, uh, and its nuclear posture review. We need to accelerate this vital partnership further, including in critical areas such as strategic planning, future force design, technological and industrial cooperation, and a systematic approach to reducing or removing barriers to sharing information, data, and technology where it is in our mutual advantage to do so. But the US relationship is not the only one that matters. We must also invest in our strategic bilateral relationships in Europe. The UK and France are the continent's preeminent military powers. Germany's economic strength gives it substantial global influence. And let us be clear, our geographic proximity means that we will continue to face many of the same threats to our security. So where our interests align and where we face common threats, we will work closely with our European allies and partners as sovereign equals or through a NATO framework, as we always have done. The relationships we enjoy with the US and European partners are well developed, but we must take a global approach to partnering. I was delighted that the leaders of South Korea, Australia, India and South Africa were able to join the Prime Minister and other G7 leaders in Cornwall. We must redouble our efforts to build these global partnerships of countries that share our values and with whom we can work to promote democracy, free trade and free societies. I think the D10, the Democratic 10, will be at the heart of that approach. We need to demonstrate our commitment through our actions and not just warm words. The historic de uh, deployment of the carrier strike group to Asia Pacific is a tangible example of both our desire to build these new relationships and the value that the UK can bring to them. They are a 65,000 tonne demonstration of the UK's commitment and investment in the region. Our commitment to working with a range of partners is not just demonstrated though by the great gray hulls of the Royal Navy. It is evident every day from our work with France in Africa to the joint expeditionary force, which draws together like-minded partners in Northern Europe as demonstrated through exercise Baltic Protector. And I'm delighted that Iceland has joined the, uh, the JEF. In our work with Caribbean and Latin American partners to counter serious and organized crime and disrupt the flow of narcotics before they reach, to the, U uh, reach the UK. And through our, our approach to global development, including our leading role funding the WHO and global education. And of course, there is AUKUS, announced by the Prime Minister, the President and the Prime Minister of Australia last night. There is no better example of Britain's approach in action than this new alliance with Australia and the US, through which we will collaborate on a range of defence technologies, including cyber, AI and quantum. Most notably, there is a commitment by the three nations to deliver a plan that will enable the Royal Australian Navy to field nuclear powered, not nuclear armed submarines in the coming years. It is perhaps the most significant capability collaboration anywhere in the world in the past six decades. This has been a project in gestation for some months right through the Afghanistan drawdown. And it's a powerful illustration of how we are building new long-term partnerships rooted in Britain's values, its scientific and engineering excellence, and in our alliances. There are only six nations capable of fielding nuclear-powered submarines, ourselves, the other permanent members of the UN Security Council, and India. Australia will become the seventh 
representing a significant commitment to peace and stability in the region, mirroring our own defence settlement, which saw a 10% uplift in spending agreed last year. These are profound strategic shifts and collaboration on nuclear projects creates indissoluble bonds around which new matrices of collaboration can be built. So we're already active globally, working with a wide range of allies and partners, but we need to do more. In order to address the challenges we face, the UK and its friends will need to take a more structured and sophisticated approach to burden sharing. The answer for the UK is in, to coin a phrase, strategic partnering. We will strengthen our global partnerships with clearer agreements about how we can coordinate our efforts to face down these diverse and fast-moving global challenges, whether they present in Africa, the Middle East, the Pacific, or Northern Europe. And this will not always be easy. It will require some difficult choices and trade-offs. It will also require us to be clear about where we will lead and where we will support others. And we must make our assumptions explicit. We need to clearly communicate. And we must be willing to be flexible to work with both old friends and new partners. Strategic partnering will require the UK to bring to bear the considerable and unique capabilities that we possess. As I've noted, we're undertaking the biggest increase in defence spending since the end of the Cold War. The UK will spend 2.3% of GDP on defence this year, which will cement our place as the largest spend defence spender in Europe. And as Permanent Secretary of the MOD at the time, I know just how significant this commitment was to unlock the modernisation of our armed forces. But the headline number alone is not the end of the story. The substance of the uplift matters too. There is now a plan for UK defence. The equipment plan is in balance. We have taken difficult decisions to enable us to invest in new technologies which provide the UK with a strategic advantage. It will deliver a force designed around the strategic context of the 2020s, not the strategic concept of the post 9-11 period and it will enable the armed forces to make a decisive contribution to an integrated cross-government approach to national security. We're making a similar investment in our ability to think strategically and drive this uh, integration across government. The UK is renowned as a thought leader and it's envied for its ability to bring together the instruments of power, but we must not rest on our laurels. That is why I strengthened the strategic capability in the National Security Secretariat and why I know the Ministry of Defence and the FCDO are doing the same. I want to drive a culture across the UK national security community of genuine insight and long term thinking. I want to ensure that we're well prepared to address the full range of threats we face at home and overseas and build our resilience to these threats. I want to ensure that we realize the vision in the integrated review of an adaptive approach to the challenges that we face. And I want to make sure that the cabinet office is properly working across government to champion thought leadership and to set the agenda. That's, it's also why we're eager, eager to learn from groups like the Council on Geostrategy. We need new voices in the national security debate, a generational refresh, and new types of expertise from subject matter knowledge of rising powers in Asia to the crossover advice from world-class technical experts. This will require a substantial cultural shift within the civil service to be far more open to bringing external voices into the policy-making process. It may not be easy and it may not be quick, but I am up for the challenge and I hope today marks an important milestone in that process. So over the last half an hour, I've set out why I believe the fundamentals of the integrated review remain the right ones. A global Britain that's problem solving, driven both by its interests and its values, and works in partnership with others. But that is not to deny that there are lessons from the recent weeks. So I want to conclude with five reflections. First, the importance of an integrated approach. Wars are not won by numbers of troops, or weaponry alone. The collapse of the larger and better equipped ANDSF showed the importance of psychological factors like morale, expectations, and faith in political leadership. 
and the techniques of hybrid war form, uh, warfare must be understood properly across government. That's why I focus so much today on the need to integrate across government and break down some of the traditional stovepipes. Second, the imperative that we are guided by clearly defined values and an unshakable belief that a democratic, secure, and economically free system of government delivers the best outcomes for citizens wherever they are. We must work with our allies and partners to categorically demonstrate this in ways which are tangible at home and can inspire those who can deliver change overseas. Third, we need to be clear on the challenges, timelines and dependencies of ambitious inven inter interventions. We should be active, but we should be pragmatic. We must be clear on the limits of what we can do, consistent in our objectives and frank about where we are dependent upon others to support us. Fourth, that public consent for foreign policy, military interventions and our wider approach to national security is an absolutely critical factor. Once support for the mission in Afghanistan ebbed away in the US, it became clear that it would come to an end sooner rather than later. That's why the IR sets out a need to further develop public engagement capability. We must make the case for how international engagement affects people's real lives and helps make the UK safer and more prosperous. And finally, I want to emphasize that the UK can make a difference. In the recent past, our armed forces, our diplomats, our development experts helped to deny terrorists a safe haven to launch attacks against the UK and elsewhere. They enabled development that improved the millions of lives and transformed Afghan society. They allowed a generation of Afghan women and girls to receive an education, and that cannot be rolled back. The value that the people of Afghanistan attached to, to that was tragically apparent as the Taliban took power. For the future, AUKUS shows us the way. Working with allies, building on Britain's military and technical prowess, assuring the conditions for peace and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that very robust, sophisticated, and I would say uplifting speech about uh, global Britain's role in the wider world. And thank you also very much for your very kind words about the Council uh, on Geostrategy. Um, one of our missions is to uh, undertake new thinking for the UK's role in the 21st century, and I hope that you find it uh, useful. Um, I was also particularly enthused by your comments about the UK's um, persistent engagement with allies and its moves to underpin collective security and provide the, the, uh, the instruments that are necessary in order to do that. And I think it gives animation to the very idea of an active uh, global Britain. So thank you very much for that. We can now move on to the uh, session of questions and answers. I'd just like to point out again that the speech uh, is public. We will now stop recording it um, and the uh, questions and answers are off the record. So please do not tweet them and please do not um, record them. Thank you very much. So we can now move on to the questions.